Well, good morning, beloved ones. And as always, I'm thankful for you tuning in today. But I'm also mindful that for a great many of you watching, your heart's desire, if at all possible, would be to meet in the church building today with the congregation. But circumstances prevent that right now in your life and in your situation. And I just want you to know Christina and I love you and we are praying for you. And I am hopeful that as we continue to see improvements in the COVID numbers in our county and as the vaccine reaches out to more and more people who want it, we would be able to reunite together again soon for worship and Bible study. And may the Lord bring this reunion very soon. But until then, I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for you tuning in today and our being able to meet together online and study God's Word together. You know, the Lord has something to teach us today, and we want to hear what that is. We want to learn what that is. And so let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we do pray for a reuniting of the congregation very soon. And I pray for all of those listening today that you would meet and minister to their needs, that you would bring peace and comfort and strength to their hearts and for whatever you have prepared for us this week. And Father, one of our greatest needs is to hear from your word, how that ministers to us, how that transforms us. And so would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see this morning? And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. just the way it is you are not a god created by human hands you are not a god dependent on any mortal man you are not a god in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are everything we can give you are God and that's just the way it is you are God alone from before time
Thank you, Christina. And today we're going to turn back over in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn over there. Now last week, we saw Paul make this praiseworthy declaration. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive together with Christ. That is a praiseworthy proclamation. Now we saw within that declaration... Very clear teaching that, first of all, a condition change has taken place, death to life. We who were dead have been made alive together with Christ. But we also saw that a position change has taken place, rebellious to raised up. We who were spiritually rebellious sons of disobedience have now been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And, of course, we emphasized this last week, this saving work is all on the basis of God's mercy-filled love and grace-filled kindness toward us, and this salvation is for the ultimate purpose of putting God's glorious character on display, certainly now, but Paul tells us also in the ages to come. So we're going to finish up this section today. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. We're going to see Paul take this teaching about our great salvation from verses 1 through 7 and sum it up in a confessional statement, a doctrinal statement of sorts. You know, it's likely that if you were in a Sunday school class where you had to memorize Scripture or you even took it upon yourself to memorize Scripture, you have committed to memory Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And we're going to look at those verses today along with verse 10. Verse 10 often gets uh, left out of this section, but it is vital to our understanding of the place and perspective of good works in the Christian life. So Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, let's read the verses and then we'll jump in. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Well, here's where we're headed today. You have been saved. And we're going to see we've been saved by grace, through faith, not by works. And you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. And we're going to see the place and position of good works, good works in relationship to our salvation and good works in relationship to God's sovereignty. So let's start with verse 8. I want to zero in for just a moment on this phrase, you have been saved. And then we'll look at the essential supports that Paul gives to it. So you have been saved. Some older translations like the King James Version and even newer translations, like the Net Bible, the New English Translation, that's a great translation, they put this statement with more of a present tense emphasis. By grace, you are saved. Here in the New American Standard, salvation sounds like more of a past action. You have been saved. I think what's going on here is that Translators are trying to capture something of the different verb tenses being used here. And I won't go into great detail about that except to say, God saving us is a past completed action. You have been caused to be saved. It's a done deal. But it is also true that you are presently saved right now. In other words, Salvation is both a completed action and our current condition. You could say this, I have been saved, yes. I am saved, absolutely. And it's all of grace. That leads us to the first support that Paul puts under this phrase, you have been saved by grace. 
you have been saved. A definition might be helpful to start with here. What is grace? Grace is God blessing us with what we have not earned or merited. So what's the blessing here in this passage? Well, the blessing is salvation. And since it is of grace, that means we didn't earn it by our good works. We didn't merit it on account of our good character. In fact, hasn't Paul already made it clear at the beginning of chapter 2 We were dead in trespasses and sins. And we were spiritually rebellious sons of disobedience when God saved us. So salvation cannot be of works. And Paul makes it clear here, it is totally granted to us on the basis of God's grace. God blessing us with what we didn't earn or merit. Now, let's go even further. Salvation, we can also say, is not a combination of God's grace and my good works, where somehow God and I both pitch in together toward this salvation. This is a popular view where people think, well, God did his part to save me, and now I've got to do my part in order to be saved, or some think in order to stay saved. This often gets expressed in something like this. Well, if I do these bad things or if I don't do these good things, I will lose my salvation. And what a person is really saying when they think that way is that salvation is ultimately based on my performance. I have to perform these good works and stay away from these bad ones. And yes, I have God's grace, but I still have to perform to be saved. They think salvation is a combination of God's grace and my works. But here's the thing. If salvation is in any way, in any part or percentage of works, then it's not of grace. By definition, it's not of grace. This combination of grace, work, salvation is also expressed in the idea that many have that I have to participate in certain church traditions or church practices in order to be saved or to appropriate God's saving grace into my life. Beloved one, you are not saved because you got baptized or because you take communion or you go to church every week or you participate in some ministry of the church These are fruitful activities, and they bring great blessing into our lives. But you are saved because God, as a totally sovereign and independent act of his grace, chose to save you. If salvation is in any part or percentage based on my works, then by definition it can't be of God's grace And what Paul is making clear here is this, by grace you have been saved. Now, to drive home this point that salvation is not of works, Paul gives us another support under this phrase, we have been saved. And here's the support. We are saved through faith. Let's just take an important side path here for just a moment, because we need to ask the question and answer the question, faith in whom? Faith in what saves us? Faith is not just some general belief that there's a God out there somewhere who loves us and cares for us and works in our lives and works in the world around us. That's all true, but let's just be honest. Pagans believe that. Idolaters believe that. That's not biblical, saving faith. Paul is talking about a specific faith, a specific kind of trust. And what kind of faith is he talking about? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know this is the faith Paul has in mind. We know this is the faith Paul is talking about because back in chapter 1, verse 15, he says this to the Ephesians. For this reason, I too 
having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you. So that's the faith Paul's talking about. That's the faith he has in mind, faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus alone as our Savior, trusting in Jesus as the one who died for our sins and rose again. It's not a blind faith. It's not a general faith. It is a specific faith, trusting in Jesus. Now, back to our text here. By grace, you have been saved through faith, and specifically that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but someone could intentionally or more likely unintentionally come along and characterize faith as a kind of work. In other words, someone might think, well, if I'm saved through faith, then faith must be the one thing I have to do. It must be the one thing I have to perform in order to be saved. But Paul guards against that kind of thinking in the very next phrase. Notice there in verse 8, he says, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What exactly is God's gift here? I think it's specifically a reference to faith. Now, the reason I think that is because the word that, that not of yourselves, the word that here, it's singular. And I believe points to something singular and particular in the verse, namely, faith. But even if you were to understand the gift, as some very trusted Bible scholars do, they understand the gift to be the whole of salvation. That is to say, to be saved by grace through faith, that the entirety of all of that is the gift. Even if you take that view, I think we're still going to come to the same place, which is this. Faith is God's imparted gift to us. Trusting in Jesus is God's imparted gift to us. What Paul is telling us here is that faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, does not proceed from out of ourselves. In other words, faith in Jesus is not self-generated. Faith in Jesus is not something we naturally have or possess or can muster up. And so faith can't be a work. Not in any way can it be a work. Faith in Jesus is the gift God has imparted into you and me. So, even our believing in Jesus, even faith in Jesus, must be attributed to what God did. It can't be something I have done. Or, put real simply, at no point can we ever claim to have done something to contribute to our salvation or to bring about our own salvation. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, if we haven't gotten the point yet, look at verse 9. Paul's going to make it crystal clear here. What does he say? This salvation by grace through faith, it's not a result of works. It does not proceed forth from works. Why? So that no one may boast. Think about it this way. If you contributed to your salvation in any way, in any part, in any percentage, then you would have ground to boast. You would have grounds to say, look what I did. But remember from last week, we said and we made it clear that although we are the beneficiaries of God's saving work and all the blessings that go along with it, salvation is all about God's glorious character being put on display, his mercy, his grace, his love, his kindness. If salvation were a result of our works, then we would have grounds to put ourselves on display, even if a little bit. We would have grounds 
to be glorified right along with God and say, look what I did, or look what we did together. But Isaiah 42, verse 8 makes it clear. God says, I am Yahweh, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another. Beloved ones, it's simple and clear. There are no good works you can do to be saved or contribute to your salvation. It is totally and completely of God's grace through faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and His work on our behalf, and even that faith is a gift imparted from God so that at every point we must always sing, and it is our joy to sing this praiseworthy song, Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. But a natural question someone might ask would be this. Okay, pastor, then what place do good works have in the Christian life? Well, we would say the Bible's clear. Good works do have a place in the Christian life. We're told that we're to spur one another along to love and good works. You will remember Jesus himself said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Good works are a part of the believer's life. Well, in verse 10, Paul tells us something mind-blowing that puts good works in their proper place and perspective. That leads us to our second and final main point here. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So believer, you are God's workmanship, and you are so because of a specific act of spiritual creation where God made you alive together with Christ. You are created in Christ Jesus. God is forming you as his workmanship into Christ's likeness for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Notice a contrast here in this section as a whole from what we looked at last week and this week. Remember how we used to walk? in trespasses and sins, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Here's how God has enabled us to walk now. Being his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, we can walk in good works that he has prepared beforehand. So we first see here good works in relationship to salvation. There's an order here that is important and essential. Good works are a result of salvation. Good works, we are learning here, are the result of new life in Christ, not a means to our salvation and new life in Christ. Let me put it this way. Good works, what is their place in the Christian life? Good works flow out of. They are the fruit of. This new life God is fashioning in Christ Jesus. And so you can think about it this way. If these good works are a result of our being God's workmanship created in Christ, then we can't claim them as our own. We can't claim these good works as contributing to our salvation. We would have to confess that everything good in us and anything good that we are enabled to do is on account of being His workmanship in Christ Jesus. But we see an essential order here. Saved by grace through faith, flowing out of that new life, good works, which God has prepared. And that leads us to think about good works in relationship to God's sovereignty. These good works, and there's the mind-blowing part, Paul tells us they were prepared beforehand. I mean, think about that. God has prepared in advance good works that we would walk in them. I think we are on good biblical ground, by the way, to assume that beforehand here, these good works prepared beforehand, when did that happen? That was back 
before the foundations of the world. I mean, that's when God seemed to do everything else in relationship to our salvation. When He chose us in Christ, He had already purposed and prepared these good works in which we should walk. So, let's say we come up with some ministry idea or some ministry work where we're going to minister to someone in the name of Christ and with the compassion of Christ. We can't even claim that idea as our own. It was prepared by God beforehand. And so all praise continually goes to Him. But practically speaking, this means God has good works that He has already prepared in advance, prepared ahead of time for you today, this week, this month. And since He has already prepared them beforehand, here's the great news. Whatever is needed, whatever resources are needed, they will already be there. They have already been prepared. So don't worry about how you will know what that work is or how you will be able to do it. He's already prepared everything for you to walk in. In my experience, some of these good works we can see clearly and recognize at the time. But sometimes these good works, we may not know until later what God was doing or the scope of what God was doing. You know, I was thinking this week, uh, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary of when we had to close down meeting in the church building. And I think back on that time, how God had prepared in advance for us to be ready for that. God had prepared in advance for us to be able to continue to minister and even widen the scope of our ministry, even though we weren't meeting in the building. In fact, a year prior to that shutdown, a young man in our church started putting just the audio of the sermons up on YouTube. That was a good work. That was a good work aimed at getting the Word of God out to folks who might have to miss a Sunday, getting the Word of God out beyond the walls of the church. But how could we have known then that that particular good work would actually put into place a foundation and a platform that we would need a year later. Well, I'll tell you, who knew? God knew, because he had prepared it all in advance. So like I said, beloved ones, don't worry about missing out on these good works God has prepared. He'll put you in the right place at the right time with the right resources to accomplish his good purposes, you just be yielded to him. So, let's sum up. Verses 8 through 10. We are not saved by good works. We are not saved by a combination of grace and good works. We are saved by his grace alone, through faith. And even that faith is a gift of God, so that all glory belongs to him and him alone. And? Good works are a result of being a new creation in Christ Jesus. And God has even prepared those in advance for us to walk in. So let's close with a prayer. Father, we come before you today with thankful hearts, praising you for saving us. And I pray today that you would impress upon our hearts and impress upon our minds this truth of grace-granted salvation and impress upon us in such a way that we would stand in awe of you, that we would marvel at the Lord Jesus Christ in whose likeness we are being made and created. And Father, we look forward to whatever good works you have prepared for us even this week, and we trust you will direct our paths in them. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.